Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues related to God and culture. And our topic today is a ministry in Europe, and particularly we'll be talking about Islam and uh, some of ministry that takes place from Europe into the Middle East and in Islamic countries. And my guest today is Dwight Eckholm, who has been uh, a part of Crew, is that right? Or uh, in trust? In trust, okay. Uh, but you were with Crusade. We were with, we were with Crusade up until eighty nine. Okay, um, all right. Yeah. So see, we're gonna. I'm gonna walk walking right. through all this. Sure. So uh, l- let's start there. What What do you do with in trust? Okay, we've been living. Actually, I've been living in Europe since nineteen seventy four. Mm-hmm. Graduated from seminary here at Dallas in seventy three. Moved over to Vienna to work behind the Iron Curtain. And then eventually it came down, and uh, so for the last 13 years, been living in mm. Athens, Greece, and I primarily involved in leadership training among former Muslims uh, from the Middle East. Uh, there are a lot of refugees who's, who've come through Athens. Uh, Greece is kind of a major landing uh, point for people coming from the Middle East, from North Africa, uh, trying to get into Western Europe. And uh, been involved in Bible teaching, discipleship, uh, you know, working with these young believers, uh, and uh, leading like a, a an outreach breakfast to diplomats. Uh, so we've had ambassadors and and different diplomats from quite a number of countries involved in that. Then I I teach once a year at the Greek Bible College, and uh, have started traveling some in, into the Middle East as well. Mm. Yeah, I we visited when I was on sabbatical yep. in Germany, and I came to Athens and got to attend one of those Bible studies. And a very, very uh, effective ministry, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Mm-hmm. Well, you. let's let's just dive uh, right in. Uh, you've talked about your ministry some in in Greece. Um, what what exactly you, you've talked about the Bible studies and the ministry sure. to the diplomats? Uh, how exactly does that work? <laughs> Okay, uh, just kind of, I'll back up a little bit historically. When we had first moved to, to Athens, I got a call from a friend who was working at a refugee center, and he said they've got a, a, quite a number of new believers uh, from one particular country in the Middle East, and uh, he knew that I was a Bible teacher, knew I'd gone to Dallas Seminary, and uh, he asked if I'd be willing to come down and teach these guys. So I went down to a place called the Ark, the Athens Refugee Center, and uh, started meeting with a group of six guys who were all fairly new believers and uh, taught them some novel stuff like observation, interpretation, application. Some basic Bible study. Bible, you know, basic things that I learned from Howard Hendricks and mm-hmm. Harold Honer a while back at Dallas. And, um, you know, had to make some cultural ad- adaptations and that sort of thing, but just started studying the Bible with these guys. And then we started working through Galatians and the Gospel of John, different books of the Bible. Uh, by the time we'd finished the first course, five of the six guys had gone on to other places. So oh, wow. I was down to <laughs> one guy named Nadir, and then we had to start all over again. Yeah. Um, but so it's you know it's a little bit like trying to do something on a revolving door. People are coming and going. Now were these guys um, <clears throat> uh, had they come to Christianity out of Islam or yeah yeah mm-hmm. they had all been raised uh, as Muslims. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them had met the Lord in Istanbul. Some in Athens. There's kind of this refugee highway going from the Middle East uh, through Turkey. Uh, an awful lot of refugees will get as far as Turkey, and then they'll pay a smuggler to take them across either up in northern Greece, uh, up, up across, uh, across the border from Turkey into Greece, or smugglers will put them on a boat and send them to one of the Greek islands and kind of hop their way across, get to Greece, uh, pay a bribe to some official at the port to let these guys off, and then they usually end up in Athens. And there are there is a whole network of refugee ministry centers in Athens, um, you know, run by a number of different organizations, and they're providing some some food, some temporary shelter, clothing, and that sort of thing. 
but they're involved in, in evangelistic outreach. So like at a place like the ARC, the Athens Refugee Center, they will have feeding several times a week, and they've got big uh, televisions up on the wall showing the Jesus film or something of that nature. Mm. Uh, they'll have discussion groups. They offer English classes because every every refugee in the world wants to learn English because they all they all want to go to California or to Canada or to Vancouver, Canada. Uh -huh. So you know that's a great calling card to offer English classes. Um, you know, and they and they they have groups for for women and children. And uh, basically, my niche in all of this for the last dozen years has just been. Uh, Bible teaching and uh, trying to mentor some leaders. So we, you know, we've had like there have been classes down at the Ark um, where we've worked through different books of the Bible. We've offered um, we, we offered a, a thing called the Athens Intensive Ministry School a number of years ago. It was a, it was a six month intensive class for a group of guys uh, that were that showed real ministry potential mm. and. Um, you know, we've 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 partnered with probably three or four of these different refugee organizations over the years. But you know, I just say basically what I'm as a blue collar Bible teacher. You know, mm -hmm. I teach these guys the scriptures, try to teach them how to teach others, and you know, once we really get rolling with these guys, then they go on to somewhere else. So so they're in Athens, <laughs> kind of in transit oftentimes, and they could yeah. end up anywhere, basically in Europe or yeah. a anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, and I, I say that Athens is sort of like a big bus station or a train station mm -hmm. where there's all these people waiting to leave, mm -hmm. and they're trying to get to Germany or Norway or Switzerland or England, you know, or to the U.S. or Canada. Um, and you know, at, at any moment, you know, they they might just be gone. You know, the refugee element of this is interesting because the situation that I'm familiar with in Germany is that the German government really invited many people from yeah, yeah. Middle East, particularly Turkey, uh, to come in and take the jobs that many Germans didn't want right. to take. And yeah. so they enter in legally, and now they have a, a significant uh, minority, mainly Turkish population. Right. I think France has got a similar situation. Yeah. And so uh, so to hear the, the, the smuggling aspect of it is, is a, kind of a new Twist for me because sure. most of my contact has been uh, through uh, through legal means and through really invitation yeah. to come into Europe. Yeah, yeah. We lived in in Germany for ten years, so I'm familiar with that. That there were you know a lot of Turkish. Even the word they use in German is Gastarbeiter. Yeah, that's so right. So they're guest workers. workers yeah. So they came as guests of the German government, and uh, you know were paid a fair wage and provided with you know medical care and all this sort of thing and there I mean you know I've seen statistics I mean there is a, a large population of Turkish workers that have stayed in Germany you know they've learned German they're raising their kids there but Athens much more of a of a, a transient situation and and the, the the economy is so bad in Greece that you know people who had jobs as foreigners have lost their jobs and it's just kind of this downward spiral of hopelessness. So they're they're all trying to get out of there. They're at the bottom of the well, so to speak. Yeah. And things yeah. and things in Greece are tough. Yeah. You yeah. know, part of the reason we we do these is it, these broadcasts on on uh, issues related to Europe and Islam and that kind of thing is because we want people to think globally about what's going on yeah. with Christianity and the issues that are associated with culture in general and Christianity in particular. I really have two ways I can go right now in terms of what I'm going to ask you, but I think I'm going to deal with the with kind of the general secular questions first and then turn sure. to ministry because I do want to come back and, and talk about uh, what ministry to people who come out of Islamic background is like. Um, but first, let's talk about the the issues that Europe feels as a result of this influx of um, Islamic presence in a variety of countries. And I'll frame it this way. Um, I remember uh, from my sabbaticals in Germany numerous times having conversations with people in which I said, in effect, you know, Turkey's tried to get into uh, uh, into the European right. Union, and uh, you know they set up the rules for Turkey to do it, and Turkey 
best part I can tell, met those rules mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. looked like everything was going fairly smoothly. But then, uh, and I don't know if this was just 9-11 or what, but, but, but the nervousness that many people in Europe feel yeah. about allowing Turkey in, although from a, from a secular structural basis, there really is no reason to exclude hmm. Turkey. <clears throat> On the other hand, from a practical standpoint and from a uh, well, from a practical standpoint, when you if you let Turkey in with all the open border situation that you have, that yeah. beca- that produces a problem. So explain kind of how <laughs> Europeans view that particular potential. Hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think there is kind of a general fear that, it, that like you said, if, if Turkey gets into the EU, then. Like they do have open borders, for example, with Iran, and I, and I think several of the other countries that border Turkey. So, and I think there is that fear of just, you know, we've got more more refugees in Western Europe than we can handle, and mm-hmm. if we take Turkey in, it's just gonna, you know, exponentially uh, in, increase the problem. Um, you know, I I I don't sense that you know the average German is is so worried about. The, the, the religious part, but I think they're more concerned maybe about um, you know just the economic effect of more and more and more people coming in looking for work and then having a right to um, the social system and that sort of thing. I mean, you know, th- there's a certain amount of um, fear of, of Muslim influence, but, you know, generally speaking, I think in most of Western Europe, it's so secularized that it's sort of like, you know, it doesn't matter what your religion Reli- is. Religion is in yeah. Yeah, having right. impact anyway. Sure, yeah. You know, yeah. So un- unless you want to come in and start, you know, killing people, um, mm-hmm. you know, I don't I don't think they're overly worried but about But is there that. nervousness about the security aspects of what open borders would mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. And, and uh, I mean, you know, I think the open borders in the, EU, in the EU have just made it a lot easier for all kinds of people to come and go. And I mean, it makes it easier for us as we travel. It certainly does. I remember <laughs> going from Germany to France or Germany in whatever direction, and you had to stop at every border yeah. crossing, and et cetera, yeah. and now you just go, and it's yeah. like going from one state to another right. in the United States. You don't even think about it. Right. Yeah, you fly in and out, and you don't, you, know, you don't have to show your passport. You drive across – I mean – and when I was doing my doctorate in Basel, I was living in Germany, and every time we passed, you know, we would have to show our passport, and they wanted to know what we had in our suitcase. And, Absolutely. And, you know, but and for a while, when we lived in Germany in the 80s, we had to have a visa to go across over into France. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I definitely remember those days. Well, let's that uh, it, it it struck me. I remember one particular conversation I had with a with a German theologian. We were just uh, spending a couple of days together talking about theology, and we got onto this topic. and And I had had the view that that um, that Turkey just had every right in the world to think about coming into mm-hmm. the EU. They had met the standards, and they had they had done what the union had asked, and um, uh, and you know there wasn't a religious uh, entrance requirement of any kind, yeah, yeah. so it seemed like they would get in without a blinking an eye. And he, he as a German, just walked through all the social, uh, uh, economic, and and security issues that that caused uh, many people to have pause. So that even though they met these standards, and I think there may have been a time when they when they offered these standards that they questioned whether or not they would ever be met. Sure. And uh, um, and so uh, so now there were all these roadblocks coming into the conversation, and I saw his nervousness, and it struck hmm. me. I, it, it's one of those conversations that you have with someone who's who lives there, where you go, oh man, I haven't even thought about. You know, three quarters of what they're thinking about and what concerns them, because I'm I'm not that immersed in the sure. culture. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's transition. Let's talk about about ministry. I, I understand also that not only have you have you ministered in the context of refugees coming to Athens, but you've also done some ministry in the Middle East. Is that correct? Yeah. And and the connection there is there was a, a young believer from the Middle East that that uh, who met the Lord in Athens a number of years ago. And uh, I got involved in teaching and mentoring him, and uh, you know, basically just an incredibly gifted young evangelist. I mean, in the space of about a year and a half in Athens, he led over a hundred 
Muslims to Christ. Oh wow! And uh, you know, was was leading a ministry uh, in Athens, and eventually was 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 able to um, be invited uh, officially to. Canada. It, 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 some Canadian people who'd been involved in him coming to Christ, and they sponsored him and invited him to come to Canada. So he moved to Canada several years ago, got Canadian citizenship, and his whole goal was not to stay in Canada and watch hockey games. His goal was to get a passport so that he could travel in the Middle East. Hmm. So now, um, two years ago, uh, he and his wife moved back to the Middle East. They're in a in a country not all that far from from Greece, and they're settled there doing ministry to their countrymen and 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 in the country where they're living. So I've I've gone and spent some time with them, and um, they have a strategy of trying to train leaders for these house churches that exist all over the Middle East. I mean, there is literally, there's a real revival going on mm-hmm. in certain parts of the Middle East. And you've got a lot of young believers who are meeting together. Their leaders have practically no training. So this young guy that we call Matthew, which is sort of his code name, uh, has been involved in writing uh, materials in his language, translating other materials. And uh, he he and his wife coordinate some training sessions about every two or three months. They'll do a two-week session, and they're bringing in different teachers. Um, we have a colleague who taught Old Testament up at Trinity. We have a colleague who's a pastor of an international church in Budapest. And these guys will go there for a couple of weeks at a time and do do some training classes. And so he, I mean, his whole vision is ultimately, you know, as doors open up eventually, would be to have some kind of more of a organized training program in his home country. But right now he's not able to do that. But people can somewhat travel. And uh, so it, it, to me it feels like what, what we're doing there feels a lot like what we used to do behind the Iron Curtain. Oh, wow. You know, huh. In one sense you have to be sort of careful. It's hard to know right. whom to trust. Yeah. And there are a lot of people doing things that we, you know, we really don't know exactly who's who and what they're doing. But you know there there is a lot going on in that part. I'm of the curious world. who's the who's the Old Testament guy who was at Trinity. Uh, his name is uh, Franz. Uh, let's see, it's a Dutch name. Give me a minute, I'll think. Well, you know, it's <laughs> it's a small world because I actually taught two weeks in Jordan, okay. and uh, and we overlapped, and okay. so we actually were roommates in the apartment okay. together because we were teaching yeah, in Jordan. Okay. Franz den Exter Blockland. Yeah, take a minute to get his name. There you back. go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, we we actually taught in okay. Jordan at the yeah. Jordan Evangelical right. Theological Seminary yeah, uh, yeah. at the same time. How about that? That's yeah. that's a that's a new one. <laughs> anyway, um, so he's got this ministry where he's where he's ministering to the house churches and and you've gone in is yeah. it to help some of the yeah. time yeah I was I um, was there uh, earlier earlier this year and um, had a chance to speak at, at, at one of these home gatherings and um, you know just 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 a delightful group mm-hmm. and uh, he was able, he translated for me obviously I don't speak that language um, but uh, it was exciting to see, you know, these groups, and there are groups like this all, you know, all over the country. Now, when they meet in these house churches, about how large a group is, are we well, talking about? This group was, I would, I would say, around forty people. So mm. it's a pretty good sized group. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a, a young man there that's leading the group, um, who has about two or three jobs. You know, he he basically pastors this church, and then he's a Taxi driver at night and a, and a house painter by day. Oh wow! And a fascinating guy. Uh, he had been been raised Muslim, and after he became a, a follower of Jesus, his uh, brothers in law came up and basically beat him up, threw him out the window, and took his wife and children away and you know, took him back home. So he's lost his whole family wow. because of, you know, because of the the commitment he's made. Now, you said that there's a a little bit of a revival going on among Muslims. Do you have a sense of what draws them to the gospel? Well, I, you know, I, it's obviously going to vary in different situations, right. but let's say like in Athens in particular, what I've heard over and over and over again is we arrived here, we didn't have anything, we had nowhere to go. And uh, you know, none of my countrymen 
came out and said, you know, here, come and stay with us, or, you know, we're going to feed you and do that. But it was the Jesus people that said, come, you know, we've got, we've got hot soup or we've got tea hmm. and, you know, uh, clothes for your kids. And basically just to see the love of Jesus in some kind of tangible way is usually what attracts people mm-hmm. initially. And uh, now, you know, in certain contexts, I suppose people are, are going to be a little leery of this, but I am hearing of an awful lot of people uh, in the Middle East who are having visions, you yes. know, where they they have this vision of Jesus. Yeah, I've heard several similar um, stories. And, yeah. you know, I, 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 talk, I was talking with um, a, a couple of these church leaders, and they were telling me about a man that they knew who had gone on the Hajj, and while he was there, he had a vision of Jesus, and he came back as a follower of Jesus. Wow! You know, so there are, and I mean, there, there's quite a number of these stories. That yeah, I've, I've heard. heard. I've, I've heard many, many stories like this, and and even I've even heard some that are that are much simpler. Uh, uh, we hope, and in a in one of our discussions of Islam, to have uh, a person who ministers in Turkey, hmm. uh, who I know who. Uh, um, and his story is the, what got him curious about the gospel was the movie Ben Hur, okay. <laughs> because uh, because yeah. he he saw the crucifixion scene, and in Islam uh, Jesus doesn't end up really being crucified, so they don't know what to do with his yeah. death and not okay. much less his resurrection, and so um, so it got him curious, and so he started to ask uh, anyone who came over from America, he said, or European, he would ask them, you know, a theological question about the crucifixion. He said most yeah. of the people that he asked didn't know, sure. <laughs> didn't yeah. know what to tell him, and then finally yeah. he met a couple who just gave him his gave him their Bible, yeah. and he said he went home and read it, and that's how he came to the Lord. So yeah. Ben Hur was the starting sure. point. So yeah. you, you, so it's amazing what can can draw. But I think it's interesting. I don't want to let this point pass sure. that that it's service ministry, if I can say it that way, yeah. that draws people because even in the life of Jesus, you see this juxtaposition between word and deed. Yeah. Now sometimes it, we get thrown off, I think, because you know Jesus does ministry with miracles and that kind of thing, and so. Uh, but the whole point uh, of the combination of word and deed was that the message had a credibility behind it in terms of the way people oh. were treating other people, that opens up the door for uh, for taking the message more seriously, and sure. you're seeing that in the Islamic yeah. world. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Now. Um, when you uh, minister to people who come out of Islamic background, what are some of the issues that you that you face either as they're coming to becoming open to the Christian faith, or on the other end, once they've become uh, believers and you're and you and they're just starting out? Uh, hmm. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> Those are some very good questions. Mm-hmm. I'm almost almost drawing a blank because there's a lot of stuff. But um, yeah, let, let me let me back up and just uh, think about that just a minute. Um, just the other day, I just before I left Athens, I, I was uh, doing a Bible study down at a at a fairly new group that's been started by a young guy that we've been mentoring for years, and there's a very intelligent young man who's about 18 years old. His English is amazing, hmm. and um, he, we talked afterwards, and he was saying that he he couldn't understand why the Bible called. People sheep, you know why we like sheep have gone astray. <laughs> uh-huh. and somehow that was offensive to him. Huh. Um, and uh, but you know obviously the, the whole idea of Trinity is is a, is a real stumbling block to mm-hmm. them. And the idea that Jesus could be the Son of God, you know, I think you know typically a Muslim is thinking, well, you know, did somehow God have a relationship with Mary and and you know that there's some kind of a physical birth here that 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 you know that God was the physical father and just you know wrestling with the whole idea of trinity 
Yes, because the conception of God is very different in Islam, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's more a distant God, a God yeah. who is extremely sovereign, a God who, who doesn't enter into relationship. Right. You're just simply to respond to Him. So the idea of a God who makes covenant, yeah. and a God who, who, um, who seeks relationship with human beings in in a. In, in a, at a relational level, that really is just a completely yeah. uh, worldview shift in many yeah. ways, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, from a lot of the men that I've talked with, it was sort of it was just a spirit of fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I need to be afraid of God and what He's going to do to me. Mm-hmm. And the idea of God being a God of love and of grace is is really you know revolutionary. Uh, I would say that you know one of the major issues that 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 I've encountered over and over again is once people become believers, they're still very very suspicious of other people. Hmm. Um, you, you, they don't know you know what's somebody trying to get from me, and uh, you know I found that that a lot of the guys that I've met who are new believers are still. You know, they, they want to talk behind the back of somebody else, or they don't trust each other. And there's a lot of divisions. And and some of these guys, you know, and, and I keep working with them to try to learn to function together. But mm-hmm. generally, you know, they want to be friends with me, and the other guy wants to be friends with me, but they don't want to be friends together. Hmm. And um, you know, it it. I mean, there's obviously exceptions to that, but there is sort of a general suspicion. And and you know, I've encountered too. That guys who get involved in different ministries are suspicious that maybe somehow we're using them to raise money in the West or something like that. Hmm. You know, taking their pictures and putting it on websites to get people to send in money. So it's sort of like, you know, what are you, you know, why are you doing this? So all that suspicion uh, gets in the way of being able to build a genuine community in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know, so I, I would say over. You know, we've just had to take the time over time to just show, you know, we are committed to you as a brother in Christ. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're not just doing this because this is our job. Uh, you know, basically, the, the the motto that we've had for our ministry over the years is from uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, that, you know, we didn't just – I didn't just teach you the gospel, but, you know, we, we shared our lives with you as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the, the people that we've – Really, you know, we've gotten to know they're very, very relational, and they, you know, they love coming to our apartment to have a meal. They love, you know, inviting us to be with them, you know, just to take time to go out for coffee together or, you know, meet, you know, very, very relational. And, uh, you know, they're very, very loyal. Um, so if you can get them to turn on the trust, then you, then they yeah. really make for good community people. Yeah. Oh, Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, well, we've talked about that's interesting. You know, you've got it's multiple hurdles. You've got you've got the different view of God and being distant versus being close. You've got the hurdle of the Trinity. You've got um, issues, I think, uh, related to uh, how the Bible is seen. Have you have you run into that issue in discussing uh, in discussing uh, the Christian faith? How they view the, how Islam views the Bible? Well. It, it, you know they they seem to have a, a respect for the Bible, mm-hmm. you know, and they have a respect for Jesus, mm-hmm. and um, you know I I find that you know we get in and say this is what the Bible says, okay, and and you know I find particularly these these new believers to be really really serious about wanting to study the Bible, and you know they don't come in with all kinds of you know theological preconceptions about what things mean. I mean, you know, we just get in there and we start reading and we're looking, you know, what does it say and, and try to figure out what does it mean and how do we apply it. And and I find them to be really, really good Bible students. And, you know, as, we, as they start to understand things in context, like, you know, I've, I've met quite a number of guys who met the Lord and they started coming to different refugee centers and they were subjected to all this kind of Bible hopscotch, you know, Mm -hmm. where the guy's up front, you know, starting out in Galatians and he jumps over to Ephesians and then he's ending in Leviticus Mm -hmm. and after a while these guys, their heads are just spinning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once I was able to get him into a Bible study and just work through, let's say, Philippians and Mm -hmm. just work through from beginning to end and it's all, Brother Dwight, 
you know, we've never done this before, and can we have another class tomorrow night? Hmm. You know, and just really, really teachable. And sort of like, you know, sort of like bluebell ice cream. You know, the more you <laughs> give them, you know, the more they want, and and you know, they, and they really recognize the difference. So, so uh, do you have a particular book that you start with? Um, I would, you know, I would say I've generally started with Galatians. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know I've used Philippians a lot, and I've found that one book that 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 people can really relate to in that situation is the book of Ruth. Hmm. You know, I, we go into the first chapter and we look at Ruth and her family and all this, and they said, now in our context today, what would we call Ruth? Mm-hmm. Oh, she's a refugee. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know. Uh. And here's the you know for economic reasons they left one situation. You know they're down here. Mm-hmm. They've had death in the family. Um, can you guys relate to this situation? And you know, and then like I, I I worked through the Book of Acts one time with a number of these guys, and you know we get to chapter eight and say, well, who was it that uh, spread the gospel? These were refugees; they were getting kicked out of Jerusalem. So hmm. you know, so and and you know they they can understand a lot of the Old Testament culture mm-hmm. and relate to it probably a lot better than the typical person in the West can because yeah, our true. culture is you know their culture is so more so much more similar mm-hmm. than what ours is hmm. so uh now that's interesting now uh is there a particular gospel that that uh that draws or um you know, we've offered different gospels, and it does seem that John John is one that they that they really jump on. Because mm-hmm. um, just so different than what they're used to in thinking about how God yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but like particularly with with uh, some of the business people and the, and the diplomats, you know, I've I've taken things like from Mark and Luke in mm-hmm. particular, and and just kind of get a hold of one of the parables or one of the situations. Um, we've got a number of people from Lebanon who are involved in that, and, and and they can somehow really connect with these stories. And you know, I would say that you know the the, the guys from the Middle East do really relate to um, you know some kind of a uh, like the, the gospel where you've got a specific confrontation between Jesus and someone else. Um, you know, they get into that. I would say more than say Romans or whatever. They're they're just not accustomed to thinking that way. Join us next week for part two of The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.